just a word or two about George. Um, George is a chartered occupational and chartered sports psychologist and the founder of the Team Up Company, which is a management consultancy firm. Uh, he's also an author. He's got a uh, book on teams coming out very soon. Hopefully he will mention that a bit. Um, he's very much into team coaching, executive coaching, working with people at all sorts of levels. As a consultant, um, he did actually able to have a track record at KPMG Consulting. Uh, so he works globally with, with uh, hundreds of teams and CEOs. Uh, he's very much a leading expert on teams and relationships, which is why we're so delighted to have you. Simon, that's uh, very kind of you. Well, I was taught at KPMG the golden rule was to un under promise and over deliver. So I, I already feel somewhat compromised by your introduction. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, let me share my screen. Just by way of introduction, then, um, Simon kindly mentioned. He said he might mention my book. Oh, well, I've blatantly put that up front just to say that in terms of my experience working with teams, I've been a consultant for 25 years and uh, been involved in team development and about five for all of that time. And um, I guess as, a, as, as um, aspiring consultants, there's two types of, types of team for you to get your heads around. One is the team that you belong to on an engagement. And of course, that's usually on a, a multifaceted team. It's your co current consultants. And it's also um, the clients, but also you have a home team back in back in the consultancy. So there's many teams that you belong to. So what you're going to hear here is about how you how you partic participate in a team, and if you are leading a team, how you lead a team. It's the same kind of principles, and it's a code that I've developed through research, um, which I'll introduce to you. It's kind of like how do you build a team, and what's the predictors of team success? And the book has been written. It's coming out in November. It's been endorsed by two very big uh, hitters, I suppose, in team development, um, whose names, if you're interested in organisational culture, one of them is Edgar Schein, who's a bit of a god in culture change. And uh, the other is um, Amy Edmondson, who's in psychological safety. So if you're going to be a consultant, I would, whatever you're going to be doing, I would think cultural change is important in your field, whatever field you're in. And psychological safety is a very, very important um, aspect of teaming so so that's uh, what where I come from and um, one thing to say I won't go through all of these it's a slightly a military picture may not be uh, you know the best possible metaphor but I put it up there because there is there is no tougher time to team in all the years I've been working is in teams the current context for teams is is very very challenging because all these factors are coming to play uh, extra regulations um, mental health issues, team team leaders and team members have to really watch out for this now. Um, you've got diversity of, of gender, race, age, ethnicity, and now you have neurodiversity uh, as well with ADHD and dyslexia and, and the growth of that area. So managing that complexity is, is not easy. You have a growth of individualism. So like it or not, Unfortunately, there is greater Machiavellianism and greater um, narcissism and psychopathy in the work in in the workplace. Societies across the globe are moving much more, much more towards um, individualism and fame. So the idea of the team is becoming compromised. And then we have, of course, the massive two topics of the time, which is digitalization and transformation, which is what's happening um, in this you know crazy world. And we have not just because of COVID, but we have virtual working, which makes teaming much harder. So put all these six things together and teaming is, is never been uh, more challenging. And just a little bit of what teaming is about. The brochure on the left says, you know, that's your organizational chart. It's, it looks quite rigid and structured. And that's what, you know, when you get placed, you'll probably be given a chart like this. And, um, and then you'll have an organizational chart. The reality is on the right hand side, it's interdependent, it's chaotic, it's emergent. It's dynamic, and so um, you know how we manage this complexity really is not, is not an easy thing, right? So, so that's the context of teaming these at, at the moment. Um, and so I'm going to ask you a question, and Simon, if I can see in the chat, then I'll read the answer. But if not, Simon can answer it. So, if you wouldn't mind putting in the chat what you believe are the most important components or the most important component of great team working. Then um, let's see what you come up with as a starting point. What do you believe is the most important component of, 
of great team working. So Simon, what have you got there? Just read out some of these that are coming through, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, of course. Um, you've got trust, communication, cognitive empathy, communication, listening, collaboration, respect for other opinions, trust, understanding, listening to one another, communications, listening, equality, communicating, communications and respect, willing to share, understanding and communication, recognizing others' dignity, cultural understanding, understanding individuals' motives and communications, communication, respect, inclusion, trust, being open to working with others, emotional intelligence, two-way communications, okay, empowerment. Okay, okay. all right. <laughs> Uh, okay. That's not a bad list, is it? <laughs> it's a, goodness me. And there's a running theme through there, isn't there? And it's the soft stuff, right? It's it's and it's uh, a lot of it comes down to trust. Okay, because all those things that you mentioned uh, have been mentioned there, Simon. Trust is the kind of the thing that is really um, you know, communication, engagement, empathy, they're all ways of building trust with people. And some of you put trust down as well. So trust is a biggie. It's by the way, you'll see that these things you've mentioned are secondary to something else. Okay. I'll come on to that in a second. But um one of the teams that I'm interested, I do some pro bono work with um the London this is the London Air Ambulance. And they're what we call an extreme team. Extreme teams is where lives are at stake, either as a result of the teaming that's taking place. Or within the team and so in an extreme team um what was what's been noticed is that um the teams have to form and it's a bit like a project when you go on an engagement you have to form relationships very quickly for a, a, a set number of weeks or months and you have to hit the ground running and team from the get-go but when these people get together on an airplane you've got the medics you've got the paramedics you've got the surgeon you've got the um the pilots and you might have a registrar as well. There's two doctors often, and they may be on a rotor system, but they certainly don't hang around together. Wait, you know, sort of, you know, they're not like a, a team that go out every night or every day. They rotate around, and so the combinations are very variable. And half a lot of the team don't know each other very well. So a bit like the Navy SEALs or the SAS or an ambulance crew or a firefighting crew. The idea with extreme teams or a sailing crew, for that matter, is they just don't have time to build all those sorts of things that you've mentioned there. They have to be able to hit the ground running and do an excellent job without what we call emotional levels of trust. And so I want to sort of challenge the thinking. In fact, the book is about challenging the thinking around teaming in this respect. And I break down trust into two components, which is um, cognitive trust more task-based and emotional levels of trust, which are more relationship-based. And together, they form interpersonal trust. Now, it's a bit simplistic because they kind of come, you know, they work together in more complex ways. But essentially speaking, if you look up trust and the components, those are the two components that you'll find. Now, if you look at cognitive trust, um, it's that we start to form this, what we call swift trust, before we even meet somebody. So before I spoke, Simon introduced me as a, a psychologist, someone who's written a book, and um, and so you start, I start, you start to have what you call reputational trust um, uh, in someone's credentials, we say. And at the same time, each of you will have your own natural disposition of trust. So some of you will be low trusting, medium trusting, and high trusting. Incidentally, if you're ever recruiting a team, generally speaking, high trusting people tend to work better in teams. So that's a, as an aside. That's what the science says. But before we meet somebody, we form this thing called early swift trust. It's very much a conditional trust. We think they're going to do a good job. And that's exactly what we want in a team these days, in these fast moving engagements and fast moving teams that are formed. And what happens with trust is that um, in these sorts of environments is we form this swift trust, which is co mainly cognitive. The swift trust we form is basically not based on empathy. It's not based on um, communication. It's not based on uh, the relationships. It's based on, really, do I think this person could do a decent job? And are we fundamentally on the same page? All right. Are we on the same page is the kind of the trust that we form, the most important form of trust that we form initially. Then we then layer on benevolent behaviours. All the things you've mentioned around communications and engagement and, and empathy, et cetera, et cetera. And so those then layer on now. That, so far, it's it's mainly kind of uh, behaviours and mainly um, you know reputation and 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 what we and the rhetoric that we speak. 
fundamentally what creates trust is reliability and consistency, people doing what they say they're going to do. So all this swift trust and benevolence has to be converted into strong interpersonal trust, and we get that through reliability and consistency. So there's a flow here. Now, most of the team development work to date has focused much more on the areas that you've mentioned. So we talk about vulnerability and empathy, and my book and the science and what actually is a lot of good science now that says in this fast work moving digitalized world, we are more moving more into the extreme teams. And before, if you want to learn, know how to build a team or how to uh, hit a team running, hit, a, hit an engagement running, the first thing you have to do is try to get on the same page. And, that, and, the, and so that's really what we're talking about here. So the code I have, have developed is something for you to think about is these three stages, which is getting set, uh, getting safe, and, and getting strong. And if you and these are all predictors of team performance. And so if you want to go into an engagement and you're part of a team or you're leading a team, then you start off by setting the team, being clear on, 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 on these three disciplines beneath. Then you build safety. Then you get strong with the, the, the foundations of those first two and I enable you to build the third one. And so we go through a different trust journey. We go, we build cognitive same page trust, and then we build emotional trust on top of that. And in fact, as we build cognitive uh, trust, we also start to build emotional trust. And then, and then together, we do the same thing together in that get strong phase. And then we end up with this lovely, profound interpersonal trust. That's the journey that teams go on. So um, the journey then is, is, is these three areas. Now going through these in turn, um, what, what do I mean by um, mission plans and disciplines? Well, most of the, uh, I think one or two of you men may have meant, no, no one mentioned the words, but usually if I ask organizational teams for the most important components, purpose will come up. <clears throat> What's our purpose? The work of Simon Senek in this area is, is interesting. It's not new, but he's very, very talented, very good writer. He talks about having a clear, what you know, your why do you exist? That's a starting point. What's the vision for the team? What are the goals that we share in particular? Those are the three parts of mission. And then in the, the team also needs to be on the same page with plans, particularly role responsibility. So in your engagements in, on client site, what are you responsible for? What is your colleague responsible for? What is your manager responsible for? What is the client responsible for? And we do these things called races that help us responsible, accountable, uh, communicative, uh, communicating and informed as various other mechanisms to really understand how decisions are made and what the priorities are. And then the disciplines to be on the same page are, do we have skin in the game? Um, do we have, are we vested in the teaming? Most of the reward mechanisms and organizations are um, individual based. We want those to be um, team based reward mechanisms. Do we have what we call agreed target behaviors? And um, are our meetings and our governance fit for purpose? Now, all of those nine, we call them shared mental models. Okay, a shared mental model is not some kind of strange request you might ask in a dodgy uh, health spa in King's Cross. It's actually a, a model of um, cognitive um, a framing that we use to see the world. We're, so, in other words, we're on the same page. So the best teams establish this very, very early on. And so when those... Um, those pilots and medics and paramedics get on a heli helicopter, they know, you know what the goal is, which is to reduce trauma. They know what their roles are. They know what the procedure is. They have a set procedure in terms of assessing what happens, uh, their, their quick um, uh, practices that they go through. They know, um, you know, they talk about and they give each other feedback afterwards. They know the kind of the rules of the road in, in terms of, um, you know, um, how they're going to operate together, they have agreed plans. So they have, they're all on the same page and they trust each other's competence. And that's the most important thing. All right. Now, what you were all talking about is the next thing, which is um, safety. And, um, and here we have the three fo focal points of safety. If you want to build and be part of a safe team, I've just done a day to day actually with a team looking at this. There are three parts to safety. And that is um, the ability for you and your colleagues to be a little bit vulnerable. When I say vulnerable, of course, if you want to be competent. And when you go into your first jobs and your early careers, you, you, you want to be um, seen to be competent and doing a good job because 
you want to get on. But actually, what you really want to be able to do is own up when you don't say no something, ask for help, and speak the truth about how you're feeling, right? So, so the best teams have people and leaders, especially that can be a little bit vulnerable. And that includes um, being able to laugh at yourself and a number of other things as well. Empathy, as we've mentioned already, is about you know the soft skills of of um, being able to relate to people, being supportive, caring, compassion, sensitivity. You know all that stuff in the first phase is very much around the task. This is really where you show hu human relations. And the big thing with psychological safety, the big area, is this con this the concept of learning and how teams engage in team level learning. Learning is the, is, the, is the key. Psychological safety provides an opportunity for the team to learn. So um, Amy Ebenson, as I said, uh, is the expert in this area, talks about psychological safety where you can speak up without being punished or humiliated. And I wanted to ask you, um, I wanted to ask you the question, actually, um, what makes you feel safe in a team? So I've mentioned a few things there. Um, things that you everyone's different um so what makes you makes you feel safe in a team is the question okay so let's see what you come up with okay so what can i say a good company culture a good leader sense of belonging no judgment yeah brilliant answers brilliant Golden answers response. Roles and responsibilities are understood, friendly behavior, speaking without fear and judgment, helpful colleagues, gosh, it's going fast, I can read here, sense of direction, being allowed to get on with the job at hand without micromanagement, friendliness and good banter and humor, team members talk to each other, shared purpose, no stupid questions, uh, not a toxic atmosphere, inclusiveness. And I think it's slowed down now. Okay. All right. Fantastic. Well, fantastic. Fantastic. Brilliant. 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 I love the people that wrote down role responsibilities and shared purpose. Not obvious, but the science tells us that when there is a shared purpose, when things are clear, we have we're on the same page. This is why the code is as it, as it is. You're already building that psychological safety, and that's that's miss represented in the literature. You have many team development consultants that come in and do a lot of soft skill stuff, first of all. But the, uh, but the approach is actually bedded, starts with this concept of clarity, because um, that, that certainty in an ambiguous, uncertain world is hugely important. So, so that's great to see. And I love the fact that leadership comes up. The number one factor in psychological safety in any team is how the leader conducts him or herself. So um, it's not the only thing that matters, but it's the most important. And if that leader ridicules or um, uses cruel luck, cruelty, not cruelty as in physical cruelty, but I'm talking about sarcasm or belittling humor, then, then that can be quite toxic. And that ha happens, can happen a fair bit, especially in the more machismo teams. Um, and uh, so banter is really, really important. And um, the culture is also hugely important. Now, culture is an interesting one because culture suggests it's organisational, and there is this um, there is this interface between a team and the culture. So, but it's possible, and this is a key message. It's possible. I've seen it so many times. In a toxic culture, you can have an oasis of safety because that leader finds a way to protect that that team. And so, it is possible, but it's harder, but much harder. So, you're absolutely spot on. Culture is a very important feature. The, put the, um, the reason I, I put a little bit of time and energy into, into psychological safety is because it's an absolute no-brainer, as it says here. It's a predictive factor. It's not, it doesn't guarantee it, but it predicts if you have safety, a lot of these, well, all of these, every single one of these through the academic research is well, they're all well established. And I want you to notice the experiments innovation element because today, uh, the, the digitalization means that we have to be able to think differently. We have to be able to um, create. We have to be able to go into uncharted charted territories and try things. We're calling it moving and adapting. Move, adapt, move, adapt. Long linear plans and 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 certainty of planning is now 
very much old school. We have to have short sprints of activities and then we then learn and move, learn and move. Perfectionism is a very dangerous tool these days to, 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 in that sense. So psychological safety is a highly predictive element. And as I said, um, it culminates in learning. And this is a picture. It's not obvious what it is because um, uh, I, I created it and I'm not a very good artist or graphic designer. But you, what you have here is mirrors, okay, mirrors. On the left-hand side, you're doing what you're doing here. You're tuning into a learning environment, in each of you individually, and hats off to you because that's the way to go, right? So left-hand side, you're individual learning. In the middle, we have a team learning where people are learning together in a team, okay? But they're learning about themselves. So this might be, um, you know, a management development program with other people. On the right-hand side is where the, where the teaming is moving towards, and that's the mirror being held up by the system that we call the team. And they're learning about how they are working together as a team. And, and as I found out today with my client, um, a well-known high street bank, I'm here in Birmingham in the Midlands, um, they are very good at number one on the left-hand side. They're pretty okay in the middle. They just don't have team-based learning enough in that, this you know, well-known FTSE 100 50 50 organization right so this is a phenomenon that i want you to understand is team-based learning how teams understand their own process feedback describe is a key thing and you can't do that unless you're honest right and you can't be feeling honest unless you've got high level of psychological safety when the team is learning it can be very strong and here we have the final stage of the of the development code is um high levels of accountability People are empowered, as the word has been used, to, 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 to act with freedom. Distributed leadership, we call it. There's good constructive tension. It's not a happy, clappy, group think type environment. People can speak the truth. They can create positive tension, challenge each other without defense. And they can, importantly, they can experiment. And um, I think one of the final things I want to say before my time runs out is you, you, this is a virtual, a virtual medium now. And there's highly likely when you go into work, you'll be working in hybrid, some form of hybrid teaming. You'll be on site, some of you, some of you will be coming in virtually. And so there's no greater challenge, especially global. The global virtual team is a very challenging team to be, to be in. So there's three scientific rules that I'm extracting. There's quite a few more I mentioned in my book. But the three big ones to bear in mind are, in a, if you're working in a virtual team, be absolutely crystal clear on what you're committing to doing and what progress you're making um, be on your actions and commitments. Be really clear. Make the ex implicit explicit. Spell it out. Number two, as I've mentioned, uh, perfectionism isn't really the way to go in, in virtual teams, especially. We want to see progress delivery. And so we want people to be moving, even if it's eight, only 80% right, get that 80% in and then go again. And thirdly, and importantly, we lose heart a little bit virtually. We don't see the whites of the eyes. It's not so intimate. We need to feel somehow some positivity in, our, in, in, in the teaming that we're doing. It's very, very important you track progress and you celebrate the successes that you're having. So the result is, um, final slide, I think. Yeah, that's my final slide, is um, just remember this pie chart, okay? What makes successful teaming um, is um, the cultural enables, so the top teams, the culture enables teams to, to be successful. Um, teams on the same page, we've covered, that's the team has to be uh, on the same page. There has to be safety, there has to be strong teaming skills. And um, but fundamentally, those aren't going to guarantee teaming. You have to bring individually each and every one of you have to bring to the table when you go into your teams two elements. One, you have to have the courage to do the things I've talked about, to speak your mind, to ask questions, to be creative, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And you have to have the talent to do the job well, make good judgment, make good calls, and make good decisions. So. Um, you know, you can have all these lovely things I've talked about, safety, same page, trust, and good empowerment and good uh, good tension. But unless you have these fundamental skills, the team won't succeed. All right. So there's lots of things going on in that team journey. 
So I hope that was of use. I'm going to end my sh my um, slide show there, and I'm not sure. I think we've got some a few minutes, but only a few minutes for questions. So if I stop sharing, yeah. So um, is there anybody out there who would like to say a few words, either by way of question or by comment, observation, sharing your own wisdom? Um, uh, the first person to turn their camera on and speak um gets the, gets the airtime we don't have very long so who would like to uh, ask a question or make a comment rachel hello <laughs> so i made a sort of comment i work in the charity sector and the issue that we have in a lot of projects in the charity sector is that you don't have permission to fail because the the, every penny is really valuable and it should be spent on the the beneficiaries but of course you can't do that work without the uh, the software and the IT systems in place so just doing a CRM becomes a massive massive thing and there isn't as often it isn't a sense from the trustees and the senior management to permit the project team to fail. And so the pressure levels within the team, it's fine. You think, okay, we've got to try different things out. But from above, if you make any failure, then this is, well, this is going to cost us more money. That's uh, And that really does apply a lot of pressure on the team. Yeah, and yeah. I just wondered if there's any sort of thinking around that side of things. Because I, I, uh, I know I get asked it a lot as a consultant, and I've been in that position. Yeah. When you said what you said there, uh, Rachel, it reminded me, you know, a little bit like I come from professional sport, and you could say if you're a professional golfer or a professional tennis player, you can't fail, you won't feed yourself, and therefore, you you know, you, you can't miss a shot, you know. Mm. And so, but if you think like that, you're going to miss a shot, right? Oh, yeah. So so there is a way to do that, right? And it's mental mm -hmm. resilience. Now, it's easier said than done. I think when you're in an organization where you have a top team and a culture that is very unforgiving, very hostile against failure, and uh, then you, you're only rewarded for, for um, success, essentially, and not for how you're behaving and acting. You don't get rewarded for sex, success either. It's... Yeah, well, then, then, then you know, you're in, a, cult, you're in a, a culture which is not, you've just got to accept that's the culture, unfortunately, and you make the best of it. And I'm sorry to say, but there is no other way other than remove yourself from the culture. I mean, you well, can be part of a revolution, okay, but you need yeah. enough people to be part of that revolution. And um, ultimately, you know, it's like any professional sports coach if you put fear into the organization fear into the team you tend to get mistakes you tend to get defensiveness you tend to get uh, no creativity and you tend to get lots of um, avoidance and mm. approval seeking as well so yeah so it's absolutely critical it's very tough critical to get the senior staff um it, it uh, yeah totally the, like the role of the leader there is to protect the measures are possible these i still would say the role of the leader somehow is to act as an air cover and protect the team as yeah. much as possible and to yeah. make to be a buffer to that and mm. create the safety where they can and that's yeah. i think a very honorable thing to do so it's a great question is there another is, do you have a time for well, one more uh, uh, george, george i was going to say um I, I i can actually see a another solution to that scenario which is if you somehow you can persuade the organizations it would be great to bring in a team coach like george He's not unique. <laughs> Other coaches are available. Uh, but um, somebody who would actually work with the management and those around them to try and develop um, a, the most effective team culture. So somehow you need to persuade them that, hey, it'd be really good if we had a team coach. Um, and then hopefully the team coach would actually be able to get over some of those thoughts about blockers most people i find it's, it's interesting it's, uh, uh, most people i find who have a way about them that isn't doesn't tend lend itself to success as i just Rachel just described if you hold the science up to them they can't really avoid that you know the, 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 there's, there's good practices bad practice and 
it's easier for someone outside like me to come in and, uh, and and be fearless and say, this is not working for you. Do you really want to have a success? Mm-hmm. If you're doing that internally, like you said, that could be a career in, a very career challenging conversation. So yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a very good suggestion. And I do do be- weddings, bar mitzvahs and funerals, if anyone's asking. <laughs> well, we should move on because we, uh, we, ha- we are stealing some time from your fellow speakers. So uh, thank you so much, George. It was uh, great hearing you. Um, George is going to be doing a full 90 minute session with us um, in November, mid November, isn't it? I forget in the date. November, yeah. yeah. And um, you can find me on LinkedIn if you want to connect connect with me on LinkedIn. I'll accept connections. And um, the, as I said, you can, the book is free. You can pre all the books on Amazon at the moment. It's out in the States in November. It's in, in the UK in, in January. And I want to thank um, Gary for giving me his slot this, this evening as well. And, um, and Yemi, he's got an amazing presentation. So um, you've got a fantastic um, uh, session, two sessions in front of you. So. Okay, thank you, George.